Mr. Mantashe, thank you so much for making time for us. Welcome back to the show. Morning, morning, Clement uh, and the listeners. Welcome to our new studios. What do you I, think? I enjoy being here. You do? I can see that uh, media houses have a lot of money. They buy new buildings. Unlike the ANC. <laughs> <laughs> you can't buy a new building when we have a building. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for making time. Um, I want us to, to get straight into it, Minister. I want to start with an issue that has been raised recently. The Daily Maverick reported about uh, this 2,500 mining applications that your department received since March last year. Why is it that you haven't finalized a single one of them, or have you? Uh, you know, uh, Clement, Daily Mavalik uh, is making me a project. And as a result of that, they tend to distort facts. We received 2,525 applications. I can break them down into mining rights 75, prospecting rights 1,596, by mining permits 854. We have processed and finalized 674 of those of those permits. One mining rights we have, we have approved 16. We have approved renewals 16. We have uh, approved section 102 of the mining right 19. Uh, mining rights section 11 23, and we also approved 32 social and labor plans. Mm. Uh, we have approved 418 prospecting rights. We have approved prospecting right renewal. Those are people who allow prospecting rights to, to expire, and they must renew, 46 of them. Uh, Section 11, prospecting rights 2, and 102, uh, prospecting rights 1. And mining permits, 101. Those are finalized applications, they total to 774. Uh, 7, 674 is not nil. It's not nil. Mm. It's 674. And those mining rights, uh, I, I know that some of the journalists in the dilemma were thinking that one day we're going to have 2,500 mines everywhere. We're going to see shafts. I read that article. They talk about shafts. And uh, to them, if a mining company and a new one opens an open cast, they don't see that as investment because it's not a shaft. Uh, because they don't appreciate the fact that gold mining is in decline. Other classes of minerals are emerging and growing. Coal and uh, manganese are leading, by the way. Just, you, yes. Yeah, I want to get clarity on those numbers you've given us. Are those the approvals? of applications that were received yes. since last year or just throughout? That is in quarter three of 2023-24. Okay. Yeah. So so, so that's, that's last year then. Yeah. Have you picked up any delays in the processing of the applications? Do you, do you have enough administrative capacity as the department? So from the numbers you've given us, is that the pace you think is good to run it as a One department. One of the things that will uh, make the industry happy is that after six months having approved a service provider for cadastral, which is electronic applications, uh, and the CETA tried to uh, impose a number of conditions on that, after six months, they have ultimately agreed that we must go ahead. So uh, very soon we're going to be announcing the actual service provider for cadastral. That will accelerate the pace of processing rights because you will be able to apply and actually receive the, the receipt. If you are applying, for example, on a farm which has already have an application, mm. you will see that yourself. Now we must have received that, that 200, 2,525. Many of them apply on top of applications. And uh, because it is manual, it takes many, many moons to sort that out. But uh, we're moving to the right direction. Would you consider that there is a backlog on the application given that manual application system? It is us who have actually announced that we have a backlog that we must work on. 
So how long is it going to take to clear the, this backlog? When the new system comes, how long do you... I, 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 I want to use two, two thousand two thousand and twenty four as a year to clear backlogs. Okay, so yeah. by the end of 2024... There must be no backlog. No there must backlogs. be no backlog. Yes. So th- but problems mm-hmm. are not the same. Mm-hmm. Problems are not the same. For example, let me give you an example. If you look into the application, Bumalang has 401 applications in that backlog. Okay. 400 applications for mining permits. They have 442 for prospecting rights. They have 21 for mining rights. That is Mpumalanga. And it, it will be followed by the Northern Cape, uh, which will have 43, 281, and 11. Mm. Can I tell you the reason for that? It's because in Pumalanga, you are mining coal. In the Northern Cape, there's a lot of emerging uh, medium, small mining companies that are mining manganese. Both of these are open cast mining uh, uh, regimes. And they will have more applications than any other uh, application. And if you go to Gauteng, you're going to find 30, 38, 8, because Gauteng is a gold mining area and gold is in decline. Mm. So what what's the backlog standing at? How many applications do you think are waiting that you need to clear out by the uh, end of this year? We had a backlog of about 5,000. We reduced that to about 3,000. Uh-huh. Uh, we're, we're continuing to reduce it. Actually, we moved teams from one province to assist in another province, which has a, a big number of backlogs, because we must clear those backlogs. But a number of them, I want to emphasize this, you find that people apply for the same farm. In certain instances, you get 37 applications for the same farm. Mm. And we must deal with that issue and say this is the first come, first serve approach in approving the, 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 the applications. So the mining cadastre system, which is, as you say, more functional and more transparent. I remember President Cyril Ramaphosa at the mining in Daba last year told the conference that the system um, was going to be implemented. And he spoke as though that was going to come soon. Um, I know you say there have been frustrations with CETA. How, how long has it been? I can't blame CETA. I'm saying we've been working on cadastral. CETA auditing the, the process is their responsibility. But we now have, we're now going we've now approve the cadastral system. Actually, to, to, to check a functional cadastral system, we had to go to Botswana, for example, and Namibia, and see how they use their cadastral system, and we, p- we picked up functional aspects of those cadastral systems in those two countries. And that's why we we're confident that this one we're going to implement, it will run. And we said to CETA, you see, if you have an issue, attach a person to the project so that we clear the cadastral system quicker. But could this have been, could, could this have been implemented much sooner? Yes. So what caused the frustration? There was a, a, a system that was in place which was totally dysfunctional. It collapsed. And we started to say, let's get a cadastral system because we've seen a number of mining regimes using the cadastral system and we're moving to it. And we took that decision. Okay. So when is this going to be implemented? It is going to be announced sooner. I expected the DG to announce it even this week. So that once it is announced, we start implementing. And that implementation includes training people on it. And so the work will start almost immediately. Okay. What, what do you think is the status of, of our mining industry, just broadly speaking? Do, do you think that we're still far from realizing the full potential of this industry? Um, you know, I've been in that industry for some time. As a worker, as a unionist. And uh, the story that mining will disappear in 20 years is a story that has thrown on my face many times. And it is a result of that we coined a slogan that this is not a sunset industry, it's a sunrise industry. And in 2009, in my studies, I did a research on the decline of gold mining. And that research opened my eyes to the fact that bigger part of South African society have always equated mining to gold mining. The lucky thing about it now, when we talk mining, we talk mining in its entirety. Actually, gold mining is in decline, platinum industry, the PGMs 
are growing. Manganese is growing. Uh, iron ore is doing well. Coal is growing. Uh, and that means the mining industry is healthy. Gold mining is in decline. And many people who are attached to gold mining tend to think that, therefore, mining is in decline. No, it is not. That's why its performance, you, you check it on the quarterly reports of the GDP, you find that mining is contributing. And every time, I want you to notice this, every time mining contributes 1.2% negative, you'll see that in that GDP, the, the overall growth will, will decline. When we make a positive contribution, it grows. So mining is performing. We have been around 8% contribution overall on the GDP. My own view is that it can grow. Yeah, because back in, 19, in the early 90s, wasn't it at 10%, the contribution to GDP? Because gold is bulk and gold was big. I want you, Clement, to do this. Take a, a, a visit to the Free State. That was what was called Free State Coal Fields. In 1950, two years after the Nazis took power, the Anglo-American company started operating the coal fields, and they worked there until two years after the ANC took power. And gold fields is finishing. And one of the difference between mining and cool drinks, for example, you make water and syrup, you produce a drink. If you take a ton of a mineral, that ton is gone. It's not going to come back. That's why every mine has a lifespan. So ultimately, every mining sector is going to decline because as you take out more minerals, the, you, you, that, that sector is declining. That is the nature of the sector. Mm -hmm. So w with the kind of mineral wealth we have in this country, how much are we drawing when you look at the global exploration spend? Global exploration has declined. That's why we started a fund. Um, we said it was going to be 500 uh, million. Uh, IDC approved their contribution. The Treasury changed their mind in our contribution. Mm -hmm. We are persuading the Treasury that give us that money because we need to spend on exploration. Because if we don't, mining is going to decline faster. But if we spend on exploration, mining is not going to decline. For example, I can tell you the growth corridor for mining will be the Northern Cape, Northwest, and Limpopo. That is the growth corridor of, of, of mining. Not the old Free State, Glackstop, uh, Witwaters Rand, a little bit of Pumalanga. Pumalanga is going to, stay, to be sustained for some time because one of the contributions that Pumalanga is making, it has transformed the industry dramatically. You have many black owners in, in, col in the collieries. For example, Sibanye, uh, no, Seriti, which is the biggest supplier of coal to ESCOM, is 90% black owned. Exaro is 31% black owned. Uh, you can go to the list and then you have a number of smaller companies. Transformation of ownership is much accelerated in the collieries, followed by the manganese. Mm -hmm. So with the fund that you're talking about, what is the plan? Where do you want to up that exploration spend? Because when I was reading up on just how much we are spending, I think we were drawing less than 1% of the global exploration yes. spend, which is down sharply from the 5% that we got in yes. what, the early 2000, yes. maybe 2004. Yes. You know, if you read the article that was written in the Daily Maverick, hmm. You're going to, to, to find that there is nostalgia about mining in general. Uh, when they say there are no shafts, they think of the shaft that you see as you go around here, big, tall shafts. They don't appreciate the fact that we must explore. And my own view is that Northern Cape, for example, is almost remaining virgin. Uh, many of the critical minerals will find in the Northern Cape and in that corridor, Northwest and in Limpopo. And once we get those, uh, that's where the future of mining will be. Because those critical minerals are at the heart of the emerging green economy. 
Yeah. You can't separate the green mm. economy from those minerals mm. and we have them. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, the, how, what do you think is impacting the mining industry? I mean, we, we're talking about illegal mining issues. There's issues around, challenges around power supply. At some point, they were concerned uh, around policy uncertainty. But when you talk to the stakeholders, what's worrying them the most? Policy uncertainty is less of a problem today. Uh, we, we talk to mining. One of the things that we have done well over the last five years is to open channels of communication with the mining industry. We meet them in the middle of the night. We meet them anywhere. We talk to them. That has clarified many of the uh, uncertainty on policy matters. Mm. But the biggest impact was, one, energy supply, unreliable, and it impacts on productivity of mining. Two, rail and logistic infrastructure. You can't take bulk minerals from, uh, from the mine to the port. And that impacts more on the bulk minerals like your iron ore and your coal. Uh, your rail to Richards Bay is a mess. Your rail to Saldana, semi-mess. Manganese to PE is semi-mess. If we can improve on rail and improve on, on energy, will again kickstart the productivity of, 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 of the mining industry. Crime is impacting. That's why, for example, illegal mining is not a mining activity, it's a criminal activity. That's why if you have followed the debate, the police backed up by the soldiers are taking a responsibility to deal with that aspect. Unreliable energy supply, the rail and logistic infrastructure challenges. I mean, th that speaks to the collapse of the institutions. Um, like when you talk about ESCOM or you talk about Transnet, when you talk to the stakeholder, I mean, as a government, you are responsible for these institutions. You're responsible for the reason we have energy unreliability. You're responsible for the mess that we're seeing at the rail um, and with the rail and logistics infrastructure. So do they have confidence that you can actually fix the problem can, when can, you have failed to fix it for so long? Can, can I give you one aspect mm. of energy, for example? I'm very close to that one. In the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, we have a program called INEP, Integrated Resource Plan, a National Energy Plan, INEP. INEP is about connecting households and new businesses. That's why we've moved from 34 to 93% access to electricity. And uh, we hardly talk about that, that we've given South Africans access to electricity or close to universal access to electricity. What we have been slow on is increasing generation capacity. And as a result of that, it impacts on the amount of collapse of supply. Let me let me give you one example. You see, uh, the Minister of Electricity is, is focusing on energy availability factor per power station. That is the correct approach. That's why you see the improvement. We're, we're now at level two load shedding today. Mm. We'll go for some days and sometimes no load shedding. And then stage six uh, reappears. I don't know. I haven't seen stage six for some time It now. was there in December. And we thought we were not going to experience it in December. I don't know that. But all I'm saying is that because that is a technical aspect of energy, uh, units in power station can, can collapse, they can blow up, they can do anything. But the focus on EAPF uh, is quite important to improve that situation. But what we should appreciate is that a combination of energy technologies are going to help us solve that problem. If we think that we can resolve that problem with purely uh, renewables, we are actually imagining solutions because renewables are intermittent in behavior. We need to have a base load, which was provided by coal. Uh, we've issued an RFP for gas. We're going to issue an RFP for nuclear yeah. because we must always partner renewables with a base load. Yeah. I suppose the point I'm, I'm making, uh, Minister, is that 
you and I wouldn't be sitting here and talking about these challenges um, on the mining industry as a result of the unreliable energy supply and the challenges around rail and logistics infrastructure if you did your work as government and maintained the infrastructure and built new infrastructure. The mining sector wouldn't have lost the billions that is lost because of the unreliable energy supply and because of the failing rail and logistics infrastructure. You see, that is a simplistic analysis, Clement. Um, you know, when you talk ESCOM, it's a state-owned entity. But when you analyze ESCOM, I, I, I think you should do that exercise. You must not just analyze what government says. Okay. Look at the capacity of the board there, because it is responsible there. Look at the, at, at the capacity of the executive, which has been hit and miss for some time. And my own view is that if you have a hit and miss on executive, an institution is, going to, is not going to work properly. Mm. Transnet, there was a, I made a statement of a, a, a methane gas. Yeah. Yet the whole group left. You said people are running away from a methane gas. Yes. Yeah. They, they ran away in one week. And, 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 and once you have that, that means you have a mess at executive level. But whose That's fault is that? We it's take yours. responsibility. Yeah. We must take responsibility for that. Mm. Yes. And what I'm saying is that if you have committed that mistake and you are correcting it, you are appointing a new CEO in ESCOM, you are going to look into the structure. That is work in progress. Okay. Um, but, but I'm glad that you do realize that because um, you say my analysis is simplistic. This yes, thing is, is layered. And you yes. talk about the board, you talk about leadership. And I'm saying the board, leadership, you are responsible for that as a government. Yes. You appoint board members. You appoint the executives. And I'm glad you take responsibility for that. Yes. I want to ask you about the methane gas. When you say people are running away from the methane gas, um, it's a metaphor, Clement. Yeah. It's uh, a metaphor. Yeah, tetapella. What, yeah. what do you mean by that? A metaphor is, in, you know, <laughs> a, as a miner, mm. if you go underground, I advise you one time you take an underground visit. If you go to an underground visit, you go to a section, and then you see mice running to one direction. Mm -hmm. Underground, don't, want, don't ask what is happening. You follow the mice. You know why? Because mice are very sharp noses to smell a methane. Mm. You know that it's a methane gas that is coming that way. Then you run. Mm. It is unthinkable to have a top executive living at the same time, whether there's a crisis or not. And that takes us to the question of the kind of leadership we appoint in some of these executions. Mm. If an institution requires fixer as to lead that institution, and instead you appoint an alpha. You will appoint a good uh, uh, manager, but not get the results, uh, which is a weakness sometimes in the systems of selection. Mm. Uh, and sometimes you insert managers, but you have appointed them to a wrong area of responsibility in terms of their capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do we then save these institutions? Um, because when you made this comment around the mice that is running from methane, that's when we had seen um, the exodus of leaders from ESCOM, from Transnet as well, your colleague Pravin Godan. No, there was no exodus in, in ESCOM. Um, well, yeah, there was the board chairperson who, who had yes. resigned. But yeah. uh, suppose I say exodus because the previous board chair, um, I mean the previous uh, CEO left. Um, there are many leaders yeah. at ESCOM who have just been leaving. Yes. Yeah, we've had so many... CEOs of ESCOM over the last 10 years. Yes. Um, and then you look at Transnet, the CEO leaves. Um, this, was it the CFO? There were other executives that were leaving as well. Yes. I mean, there's, no sustain, there's no stability there. Yes. What, what's the issue? Uh, do you think your colleague is just not getting the right people? I can't blame the colleague. Can I tell you why I can't? Mm. It's because a colleague wants to appoint a CEO of ESCOM. They've just appointed one. But they will bring that uh, CEO to the cabinet, okay, mm. and we're all free to have comments and say, uh, do you think it's a correct appointment? What are the attributes that makes you appoint that issue? Therefore, when that executive collapses, to a great extent, we must all take the blame, okay, 
But the primary responsibility is on a line minister, mm. of course. So he must take responsibility. Yes, he's a line minister. That is where the basic line uh, responsibility is. What do you think is not getting right? I don't know. Well, I've I'm interviewed 12, many. I'm, I'm running 12 SOEs, uh, Clement. Yeah. I'm running 12 SOEs, and uh, they're all performing. L uh, let me tell you what I'm told, and yeah. I've interviewed many of these people that have left these institutions. I recently had the um, the former board of ESCOM chairperson, uh, what's his name? I forget. Umpo. Umpo. Um, before that, I had the former board chair of ESCOM, Professor Malika Borumakhova. The common thing that they raise about your colleague is that there's interference. Then why don't you invite my colleague here? I've been trying. Can you call him for me? Because clearly he's... Okay. He's I think the best thing would be to call my colleague here. Symphony Lungoku. <laughs> I've tried. Yeah. I've tried many times. Now talk to me about yeah. self. <laughs> I will tell you it was at this point. It has moved to this point. Yeah. Talk about Mintek. Ask me about uh, Joe Kans uh, the, 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 the CGS, I will tell you it was here, it is here now. I will tell you out of the 12, six of clean audits yeah. and so on and so forth. I'll ask you about that. And that is not an accident. Yeah. Uh, Sue, who's calling us from the West Rand. Sue, good morning. Good morning. Sure, go ahead. Um, hi, good morning, Minister. Morning, Sue. Can I ask you, morning, how is it possible that a, a mining license being given to a mine in the Fleurhof area. It's in a built-up area, and the houses are less than a kilometre from the mine. The houses are subjected to numerous explosions daily. They've been experiencing cracks on the walls of the homes, but mostly it's an environmental disaster. And I just wanted to ask that when you do grant a permit or a right, do you take into account the locality of the dwellings? Mm, okay, so this is, you're saying it's a license, a mining license that was granted to a company that it in, in, is in a residential area in Fleurov, in the West End, yeah? Yeah, yeah the, okay. the house is a, a kilometre from the mine. A kilometre from the mine, All right. So thank you for the question, Minister. No, <clears throat> mining rights and all application processes in provinces. There's an office in Johannesburg, we have received a number of these uh, problems that you are uh, blasting and the houses are cracking. They are attended specifically. And therefore, I would uh, ask the caller to approach the regional office. If they don't respond, approach us in Pretoria. We'll attend to that issue. First of all, check the correctness of the information and see if it is the real impact. Because sometimes when people don't like mining, they make all the one time went to 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 a, to a township in Bumalang. They were saying houses are cracking, and we couldn't find a single house crack. All I'm saying is that please give us that that case. We can we'll investigate it and we'll respond to it. Okay, uh, um, is it uh, Jethro, Jethro in Alexandra? Good morning. Morning, morning, Clement. Morning, Minister. Morning. Sure, uh, Minister. Um, Yes, Minister, I'm very disappointed uh, from your office in Pretoria. Uh, there's a community called Eight Falkland, and I'm aware that you are aware about this case, and you're not doing anything. Even there are government officials, we've been going in and out to Pretoria, but they're not assisting. Uh, there's a dispute between Bushfeld, Vanet, Combine, and the landowners. So now the minister, it's been on your table for more than a year. What's years. the dispute this about just, though? Is it about the development the, in the, the community? Yeah, the development and another thing, those uh, this, this mine is operating there without the agreement with the landowners. And the minister, you know, there was a time sometimes last year we came to you, you, you were supposed to, actually you were going to address the student. We came in and later on you said, we ambushed you, of which we didn't ambush you. We wanted your attention to come in. And you promised us you're going to address this issue from last year. Now... Mm. We had a meeting with the DG last uh, around the 18th of December. The DG said, no, he's going to come back to us about our complaint, our dispute with that mine. But they're not saying anything. Good. Okay, got it, got it, Jastro. I think I get the question. Minister, you're aware of this ma matter? Yes, uh, but what, what doesn't make a case strong is when you distort facts. Put your facts on the table. Bushveld applied for a license many years ago. 
and then the landowners, the consultation happens before mining starts. If in the middle of mining uh, you raise new issues, that is a case that should be attended separately because, you know, we, we find people who, who think that, for example, uh, they will negotiate a social labor plan. A social labor plan is not negotiated by them. It is applied by the miner and we approve it. It, it works in communities. But, you see, he is saying, he talked to the DG in December 18. Obviously, you know, the latter part of December is a dead period. We're at the beginning of January, and he says, you are not doing anything. I think that distortion of facts, and, uh, and the DG, I will talk to him. He will attend to it because if he listen to them on the 18th, he will put together a team to deal with the matter. Mm. But it doesn't help to say, you met us in December, you are doing nothing. Uh, mining is national. And if you have a, a complaint in December, you are attending to it, a team is working on that, uh, your response will, will not be the following day. Zahir in Lenegia, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Clement. How are you doing, sir? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Fine, thank you. Good morning, Minister. How, morning, how are you Zahir. doing, sir? Morning. Um, thank you for, for taking my call, Manuel. Um, the purpose for my call is um, we're residents here in the Extension 1 in Lenegia in the southern part of Johannesburg. And for the last 13 years, we've been plagued with a bit of a flooding problem as a result of the wetland. Um, last year, we had probably about 22 million rand worth of homes lost due to the flooding, especially when it started raining. And we had Mayumpo Mahasi come out, um, and apparently there's been a report generated that was sent to Minister Mantashi's office to say that mining silt that is being generated from mining activities is actually what's blocking the Kripkripi River, which is resulting in these repeated flooding. Um, and the reason I'm calling today is we had another scale last night. We literally had JRA here and disaster yeah. management trying to assist us to pump out the water. But we're very afraid because there's many elderly people here. Mm. Uh, lots of people don't have insured homes. So so for 13 years, we've been dealing with a flooding problem. That seems so the to issue is, is the rehabilitation of, of these mines? That, that seems to be the case. For whatever that salt is being generated as a result of the report sent by the mayor to Minister Mantash's office, we haven't seen much activity, and it's constantly on the backs of the residents to make sure that they're calling JRA or calling, um, I don't know, disaster yeah. management to try and assist us. But nobody's been able to get to the bottom of the problem. Yeah. In- Sahir, I got you, got you Sahir, in Indonesia. Minister? The reality of the matter is that Salt blocking water, uh, I'm trying to imagine that. Uh, number two, which mining area is that? L- uh, Lenegia South, I-, I don't imagine any mining activity in that area. Uh, and wetlands is not a mining activity. But the case that he's uh, talking to, I'm not aware of. Mm-hmm. I must confirm that. Uh, maybe when we see the details, we'll be able to follow it through. But I, I, I have questions in my mind. Which mining area is this? Which salt is that? And uh, why is wetland regarded mm-hmm. as a responsibility of a mining activity? W- what must he do? What recourse is available for him? He, he can come to us in Pretoria, leave the, the province. Maybe he doesn't attend to it. Come to it, 70 menges were staying there. Okay. Were there all the time. L- let's talk about illegal mining now, Minister. Are you addressing this issue? Because a lot of South Africans feel like your department is failing, government just generally is failing to deal with illegal mining. I mean, we witnessed the terror that, you know, Zamazamas have brought to, to communities. In fact, last year there was just an escalation of violence by these illegal miners, especially in the south of Johannesburg. Can I tell you, the reason that illegal mining is primarily given to the police backed by the army is because it is not a mining activity. It's a criminal activity of armed criminals. And that is what is attended to. And I'm appreciating the work done by the police, by the way. They're doing a lot of work there. But Are they, Minister? They're doing a lot of work. They arrest a number of them Look at the system. One time they arrested 700 people, put them in prison. Uh, many of them were, were released on a small bail. Do you get my point? When the system doesn't talk to the reality of the matter, 
uh, it collapses the, the effort. But police and the soldiers are doing their best. We are following them behind by sealing holes. We've sealed a number of holes, uh, and that goes very slow. We will see about 40 per annum because of the amount of money we're having, and we're doing that. What, what do you think you and the maybe the Lesotho government can do in working together to deal with this particular issue? Lesotho government, we have been accusing them of uh, complicit in this issue. We're engaging them, but uh, they will deny because nobody wants to be associated with crime. You know, we don't know. But the reality of the matter is that in a number of these, you find the majority are, are Lesotho citizens. Other citizens, we are beginning to see Mozambicans, we are beginning to see Zimbabweans in illegal mining. But our responsibility in illegal mining is to follow and seal the, 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 the holes. Police and the army are dealing with this. It's, an, it's, a, it's a criminal activity. It's war on the economy. Why have you not taken any action against the former president, Jacob Zuma? You see, I don't know what people expect us to do. I am a member of the ANC. I take a decision uh, to walk away and work for a different party. Mm. Uh, what should the ANC do? You are working for a different party. Uh, and uh, when people ask me for advice on this issue, I said, let's focus on the work of the ANC. Don't follow Zuma because he wants to work for something different. And if you, you put life into that, it can take you off the rail on the campaign of the ANC. Mm. Because he still claims to be a member of the organization. Now, he knows that he cannot be a member of the ANC and vote for something else and campaign for something else. He knows. He was the president of the ANC. And uh, many things he has said uh, shock many of us. For example, he is having a, a language of an ANC of Ramaphosa, meaning that when he was president, we're basically his slaves. We're working for him. He had an ANC of Jacob Zuma. And my own view is that lessons that were given to us to, in the ANC, including by him, is that nobody is bigger than the ANC in the ANC. The ANC is much bigger than and all of us together. What does your constitution as the ANC say if a Gwede goes and campaigns for another party it says, while still belonging in the ANC? He's not belonging to the ANC. The, the, the constitution says uh, that person is breaking his commitment to the ANC discipline him. Yes. Yes. The difference is, just close your eyes, uh, Clement, and hope that the, the, there's a, an, an election campaign. You leave the campaign, you focus on the uh, discipline of Jacob Zuma. All focus will be in that uh, discipline. But the reality of the matter is that record the activities of Zuma at a, a correct point. You call him to the discipline, basically to formalize Mm. that he has walked off the ANC. Yeah, but you, that's why you've got the National Disciplinary Committee. It's not the whole ANC that focuses on Zuma. No. You can do multiple things at the same time. You so you committee. can focus on the campaign, but you can have the team uh, whose responsibility is to discipline members when they, they transgress the constitution to do their the, work. You are a communicator. You know the impact of propaganda. Okay. Propaganda can actually overwhelm you if you are not careful on how you handle the issue. Mm. It, it, it overwhelms you. Uh, Zuma takes an action that he knows he has broken his membership of the ANC. The ANC will have to formalize that. How they do that will depend on the general committee. But the reality is that, please, don't put all your eggs on that issue. It is going to derail our campaign. There will be big propaganda mm. around Zuma's campaign. So you'll attend to it later. Yeah, it will be So he will be disciplined, will but be just disciplined. not now, because you yes. don't want to be misdirected. Yes. Okay. Um, did you see that he tried to, to visit the families of, of ANC veterans? He, he did something that he knew is not what he should be doing. He has walked off the ANC. He wants to visit ANC veterans. That is a, a paradox. 
Uh, he's trying to recruit them, maybe. No, it's a paradox. It's a, co it's a conflict of interest. Yeah. You know, I, I listened to him talking on two occasions. In one occasion, he talks and talks and talks, and then, please vote the ANC, and he said, no, no, not, not the ANC. You see. Uh, in another one, he sp speaks for 30 minutes, talking about the ANC and explaining how the ANC works. And to me, uh, I think he is expressing his grievance the wrong way. What do you think is have happened to him? What What do you think went wrong for I don't him know. to take this drastic step? I don't know. I don't know. Have you not engaged him? I've I've not engaged him on this matter, and personally, I don't think we should engage him on this matter. Okay. From From Jacob Zuma to your Secretary General Afikile Mbalula, you've already commented on the statement he made about the former president. <sighs> there There were reports, and I know the ANC has released a statement that he hasn't been gagged, but as the NEC, are you concerned about how Figile Mbalula is conducting himself in that office? Because there's many times when he's made statements that as the leaders, you have been at odd with him for making such statements. Can I, can I tell you, Clement, the worst thing is that you, you are trying to drag me to is to discuss individual leaders of the ANC. That is not done. It's taboo. I can't come here and discuss a Ramaphosa or a Malola or something. It's not allowed. I'm asking about someone but who carries the no, message of the organization no, no, and whose responsibility no, is to communicate no, the message of the no. ANC. When there is a mistake in that process, we'll deal with that mistake. But I can't come to seven, Radio 702 to discuss Malola. Oh, you discussed him to the media when they asked you and you thought he was no, wrong for having spoken like that. I did like not that. discuss him in the media. I called that message to order. Hey, and, and that's my responsibility. Now, I cannot say when I call you to order, I make it that a newsworthy issue. So you've called him to order? That's it. Do you think that there's been a trend where he's been saying we've things? We've called him to order, we've discussed with him, and I don't think we should continue trying to make that news. Okay, so you've called him to order and that's that. Um, do you think, and, and this is a question that came on the WhatsApp line, as you, as the ANC head to the elections, do you think you have a good story to tell as you campaign ahead of the elections? I don't think it is only a good story to tell of the ANC. People in South Africa have experiences on the work of the ANC, various experiences. Uh, yes, there would have been setbacks. The mistake we're committing as a, as a, a society here is that you make progress when there is a mistake, you want to wrap it off. For example, let me give you three examples. I go to a village, uh, all of those houses are art deep houses. Actually, we've given 4.7 million houses to people. People come out of that and say to me, uh, they, they, there's nothing to show here. This has not done anything to me. Uh, they gave me an RDP house, but it's not electrified. Now, you see, that's a contradiction. You have got an RDP house, that is something to show. You want electricity, raise that issue. INEP will, will send people to connect you. Number two, <coughs> we, we talk of uh, unemployed graduates, for example, which is very bad. But what we are not preceding that debate with is that the funding of university education for poor families has increased the volume of an army of young graduates. Let's work into that. And my own view is that once you have those graduates in society, they will change the state of that society over a medium, long-term period. They may not get immediate employment. Let's try to ensure that they work. Others must create jobs. Mm -hmm. Others must form cooperatives and work together. But that there is an army of them coming to society yeah. is a positive intervention. Okay. And you, lastly, electricity. I will be failing myself I don't talk electricity. You take every village in South Africa has connect, is connected to the electricity. Uh, I study... Every village in uh, South Africa? Every village. Take me to a village that has no electricity. If you can do that, Clement, I will send a team tomorrow. 
Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you on that because I'm out of time now. It's exactly 12 and I need to move over to the midday report. But thank you so much for coming through, thank Mr. You. Mantasha, to engage. I hope I'll have you back on the show soon. Thank you. Hanging out with Clement on 702. Let's walk the talk.